imagine to myself taking this data, but it isn't. Not yet. Um, but you have, you've heard the expression, though, haven't you? The elephant in the room, people avoiding an obvious problem. What I'm going to talk about today is the moment you see the elephant in the room. You realize it's such an obstacle that nobody pays attention to and everybody goes around and you start understanding what is happening. This is identifying bias. So, uh, speech today, uh, don't feel the, feel the bias. Where's my ear? There it is. Don't feel the bias. It's a very cool pun. So, that's what it is after. Let's have a look uh, to begin with with what Google comes up with. What am I? There you go. I'm an expert. There you go. Who's doing this? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is what uh, comes up uh, under bias when you Google it. I've, I've only taken the first uh, entry here. Uh, look at these words prejudice, partiality, uh, racism, and sexism. Do I need to go on? It's not good. Okay, it's not good. I'm going to stick with two, favoritism and uh, what is the other one? Uh, preference. Okay. Favoritism, again, put it back into Google and you end up with the first, the first finding of favoritism is, do I even press the wrong button? There it is. Okay, I got it, I got it. <laughs> Gender bias comes after favoritism. Gender bias took a while to figure out from a very simple observation. Women make less money for the same job that men do. And if you look at this graph, you can clearly see there are reasons why women might make uh, less money. There is gender bias in these reasons themselves. Let, let's this out of the conversation for the time. But at the very top, it says unexplained. This is gender bias. Favoritism towards men than the women. Men make more money as a result of pure favoritism. But this is not the type of bias I'm going to discuss today. Okay. Um, this is the other type of bias, preference. You ask me what is the best place to go on holidays, I'm going to tell you Greece. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, unless you plan on uh, spending money and actually visiting Greece, because then, as soon as the money comes into play, you need to know, I'm Greek, I'm biased. Okay. That can take a different turn. Think about you asking me, what is the best school in the UK? And I'll go straight, I'll say, you know, CSFC. And that's also biased, but this time there is a bit of vested interest, which means that I benefit directly from you spreading that opinion. Also biased, so you need to see that. But let's cut straight to the chase. Uh, this is Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon defined bias, among other things, in his book of Organum. This is not how he written it. The words are his, but the way I present, it, present them is mine. So there is a bias there from my end. Okay? I want you to focus on how this is written. Bias is a system of beliefs you have, which you don't want to change. Sometimes, most times, you don't even know you have it. Plenty of times, you don't want to change it. Uh, and you can see, uh, even when evidence comes to the contrary, you either refuse or deny the evidence, or you fight it violently. So uh, it is a problem, and I'm going to start my little story with that last sentence. People are not ready to sacrifice their initial system of beliefs. They are their initial first conclusion, the authority of that first conclusion. And in science, authority has been a problem as much as it has been in everything else. I'm going to stick with a very uh, brief story here. Uh, this is, well, this is just a graph, I know, uh, what did I tell you? Uh, this is Millikan. Millikan is famous for measuring, I'm simplifying things here, the charge of the electron. Uh, that was done in the early 1900s, and his value was quite low. And you can see here, this is the currently accepted value, this is where he started. The important thing is this, people try to replicate his experiment and every single publication after Millikan came up, came up a bit higher. Not too much, not straight to the final value, just a tiny bit higher. Now why was it only a bit higher and systematically a bit higher? 
Because people were biased. They couldn't argue against the authority of Millikan's experiments. Even if they had the original, the, the, the true value of their answer, they would do their experiment again and again and again until they found some sort of a certainty that would bring the value close to Millikan's. So it took a number of efforts, that curve, to get to the true value. People had to break the authority, move away, away from it. So authority is a cause of bias. There are plenty of stories I won't go into. Um, but uh, starting from Millikan, I'm going to make a couple of connections. Millikan was in Caltech, California, and in the 1940s he got a student. Uh, I've only got the name. Uh, I don't want to put a picture of this because you might be biased. He doesn't look very scientific. Okay? <laughs> but the name is quite a thing, Fritz Zwicky. Fritz Zwicky is the father of modern astronomy. Uh, and Fritz Wicke came to Caltech to work with Millikan. He has many contributions in, in physics and science. But in astronomy, he made a huge, created a huge debate right in the 40s. In the 40s, we had news about the universe. The universe expands. This was brand new. Only 20 years earlier, we didn't know anything about the universe. We thought it was static, never changing. And now the universe expands, and we have data. And as we can question the nature of the data, he identified a source of bias. There's something wrong with the data. We cannot treat nearby data the same way we treat data from far away. This caused a lot of issues, but also a lot of research which led to the problem. The problem was we don't have enough mass to explain how the data is translated. This is where we started. Uh, Zwicky also had a thing for telescopes being an astronomer himself. And he really liked, he really endorsed what we call the Schmidt Telescope. Now the Schmidt Telescope, I won't go into much details here, but it solves one big problem in optical astronomy. Clearly this is not optical astronomy. This is from a paper from these people who solved a different problem that we have in selfies. Observe, uh, with a laser there, observe what happens to Lucy's face. Lucy uh, sadly finds her face at the top of the picture and there's a bit of distortion. Things look larger. This is the correct one. Okay. Now the Schmidt telescope solved that problem because what you do is you project a sphere, our field of view is always a sphere whether we see it or not, our sphere we project it on a flat piece of paper or a film. Uh, we need to solve this and the Schmidt telescope solved this. As a result we can now go on and do a large area survey of the sky. We can go out and map the sky, keyword map, and look for that missing matter. So, this is me, 1997. Uh, at the telescope, we went to Cerro Tololo in Chile. Now, uh, here's bias. There's a, always bias somewhere. This is not Cerro Tololo uh, in Chile. This is actually La Palma. This is a different telescope, but this is the nicer picture, not the right one. <laughs> Point is, we went to Chile to uh, create a map of the sky and find the missing mass. Now, crash course in astronomy, okay, or rather the universe. Right, we are made of protons and neutrons, I hope everybody knows this, okay. The planet's made of protons and neutrons, and the sun is made of protons and neutrons. Now, we care more about the sun than we care about the planets because the sun is 99.98% of the mass of the solar system. So the planets, thus, the mass we have is tiny. Stars, as such, are made of protons and neutrons, and they're very easy to see because they're bright. Stars form galaxies, galaxies form clusters of galaxies, and clusters of galaxies form filaments, and this is the large-scale structure of the universe. At least that's what we think. Okay? So we went out to find that mass by looking at those maps, creating those maps of light, and from the light we had to plant the mass. Now what has happened uh, before that, that was 97, in 1986 there was a discovery a discovery of this galaxy here named Malik 1. Malik was the astronomer who discovered this galaxy. It's a spiral. It has this very bright bulge that's the central part of the galaxy. And it has two tiny spirals, and you can barely see them here. Uh, let me show you a picture of a galaxy. This is what we think our own galaxy, the Milky Way, looks like. 
slightly different, the bulge and the spiral arms. Beautiful, clearly distinct, very bright. Now Marlin knew there's something wrong with this guy here, so he looked closely, a lot of science, a lot of nights, a lot of years, until we got a better picture of it. There it is, and here they are. Now this would be a very important uh, finding, unless we realize that our own galaxy, if we scale it to Marlin size, it only fits just there. It's tiny. Actually, our galaxy is plenty large. Marlin 1 is huge. It's the biggest galaxy we could definitely know. And what we thought we would find by looking at its light doesn't include most of it, because all this part, the spiral arms, we cannot see. They're not very bright. As such, when we go out looking for mass in the universe, by looking at the light, we might be missing out on stuff. And we might be missing quite a bit. Uh, so here we are looking for galaxies like these, and what we see, what we find, is nothing. We broke free from one bias, that all matter emits light, and as such, when you make a map of the universe by looking at the light of the universe, you'll see the ma mass, but we couldn't see the next uh, the next fire. So this is what we broke free from, not all part of the universe of its light, but uh, we came up across the new one, which is not all matter in the universe is made of protons and neutrons, which means that we're missing about 95%. This is now a huge bias. A map that we think has the information, yet it doesn't. A map we didn't know that it doesn't have the right information. Have a look at this map. Map of Wales, January 2021, all the vaccination centres. This map caused a lot of trouble to the Welsh government because people from the middle of Wales said, this is unfair. Why are the people from the north, the people from the sky, having so many more vaccination centres? This is unfair. There is a bit of information missing from this map. Can you guess? Here's another one. Map of the world. This is a good map of the world, you'll see. Now, if I were to use this map to make decisions, thinking that this is a map without any bias, there's no hidden information, or there is all the information I need to make uh, to make a decision about the people who live on the planet. Now, look at the same map with this extra bit of information. How can you use the previous map to make decisions about the people who live on the planet when you miss out this information? A map you think has the information you think is the suitable tool for you to convey some uh, process of political decision or otherwise. I want to finish off with another map. This is the map that Google Maps used to use up until 2014. This is the map I grew up with. This was everywhere in the, in the classrooms. It was a map of the world. This is what it looked like. Now, if I were to ask you here, what is bigger, Greenland or Africa? There it is. Greenland or Africa? Three options. Greenland is larger. About the same. Africa is larger. Now, you can make your own mental um, answer here. Let me show you the answer. 2.2 million for Greenland. Ready? 30.4 million for Africa. They don't look it, do they? Do you remember? Do you remember the Schmidt telescope? The problem at the top, the big head, that's what we have here. You want to make a decision based on this map, you have the wrong type of information. There's a bias in the, on this map because of the way the information is presented. And here's another one. I'm going to skip this one. Here's another one. Here's another map. A map that shows information. This map was uh, created during the Battle of Britain, July of 1940. The Royal Air Force was fighting, it's an air battle. The German Luftwaffe over the English Channel. As a result, planes, aeroplanes returning from the battle had bullet holes in them. There were many casualties, as I hope you appreciate, and uh, they were trying to minimize those casualties by observing the state of the aeroplanes coming back. And every little dot here is a bullet hole on that plane that returned from battle. So they thought, okay, look at that, there's a concentration of bullets here, concentration of bullets there and there. Maybe we can reinforce these areas because they take all those hits and we can improve the um, 
the survival rate. They did reinforce those areas, they did improve the survival rate. Because there was a bias on this map, not the way the map is representing the information, the representation of information is fine, but where the information comes from. These are the aircraft that actually made it back. The ones who didn't, the ones that were trying to save, we have no information about it, or you can rather say that uh, maybe these parts are the parts where those hits won't allow those aircraft to make it back. The bias in the information is there. The hardest part is to identify it exists. The hardest part is to be able to see it, like the elephant in the room. Once you see it, then you have a total other group of problems. Thank you very much.